So I want to thank our, our, our guests to speak, uh, really to have a conversation about a uh, complicated and topical question, which is the, not only the election, the coming uh, legislative election, but really the political environment, political outcomes that may result from the election. Uh, and there are all kinds of scenarios that one can think of. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, doom and gloom out there. Uh, but the truth of the matter is it's very, a very uh, unpredictable, uncertain uh, environment. Uh, and we're going to try to get to, to all of that with our, with our guest today. As many of you know, when we do these things, we uh, rather than having each member speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, what we try to do is I try to moderate a discussion, a discussion among the members, but also with you. And I'm going to be coming to you for your questions and comments and make this as interactive and as engaging um, as possible for the next uh, uh, hour or, or so. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, our guest today, and I'm going to go from my immediate left uh, forward, uh, Francisco Monaldi, who uh, is in multiple places at the same time, it seems, uh, at Rice, at Harvard, and uh, probably four or five other places. Uh, he is a, a true political economist, as I like to say looking at the oil industry as well as the, the politics and the importance of oil on, on political stability in Venezuela and in the region. Um, let me tell you how this panel all started, and it's Alejandro's fault. Uh, he, uh, uh, w this book that you see on the screen uh, that just came out this year, right, uh, is a book that he just published, and you can see the, the title there. And I thought that it would be a, a wonderful venue for him not only to engage uh, on the topic of today, but to talk a little bit about his book and maybe how, what are the synergies between uh, the book and what we're seeing in Venezuela, the political environment today. Uh, he is a professor at uh, New, NYU, New York University. Uh, and he'll, I'll let him talk about his book and I'll sh make sure that we leave time for the plug. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, uh, lastly, but certainly not least, is my good friend and colleague uh, from the law school here at FIU, Manuel Gomez, uh, who is now associate dean at the law school. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <It's laughs> uh, he is uh, an expert in arbitration and, uh, and the issues of uh, judicial and institutional limitations. And every time we have a discussion, of course, in Venezuela, Manuel Gomez is a fixture at these discussions, and he's been a very strong supporter of LAC, and we appreciate that, Manuel. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start the, the discussion. Um, I'll tell you what, let me give you just a, a, my immediate impression, have you react to it, right? Um, one gets the impression that the Venezuelan government, Maduro, is figuring things out as they go, right? That there is a sort of a disorientation. There's a lot of improvisation. Uh, and if that is true, then, and they're figuring it out as they go in this very unstable, uncertain political, economic, social environment, um, is the cost of losing so high that they have to commit the kind of fraud that would at least give them a small majority in the election. Francis. I think the cost is very significant, uh, although uh, it depends on, of course, on the magnitude of the of the loss. But I, I, I think it's very hard to to make to, uh, to you know to 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 do what it takes to to change the result because the. Uh, uh, you know, the margin is so large at this point. Uh, I mean, a 30-point margin, unless you totally get rid of the uh, uh, audit process that, you know, basically, you know, in Venezuela, you have to print your vote, put it in, on, a, on a ballot box, and, and those ballot boxes are open. So you can uh, 
do fraud in the margin, like the voters that do not go to the uh, to the polling station, uh, etc. But it, but it's uh, it's not easy to they, make. A, a but do they have that. the capacity to do fraud? This is the sort of the improvisation. I mean, you, to do fraud, you have to. It's a sophisticated exercise, right? And I don't want to diminish and underestimate them, right? But but that's a tough thing to do when the margins are even high. So if they're looking at a loss. They're figuring things as they go. What does what does that say for the 7th of December? I mean, I, I think on the margin, because, uh, I mean, the elections are 87 uh, circuits and then, I mean, uh, uh, member deputies elected by circuits and then the other ones are, are list, right, are proportional representation. So in the, in the rural areas, in some circuits where the Chavismo is uh, strong and the opposition is weak, uh, there might be some tight uh, uh, elections in which fraud will be could make a difference. Uh, uh, so, so I, I'm not uh, I do not underestimate the the role that that so I mean they they have been doing all sorts of things right. Uh, the the, the I, one big one is I don't know if everyone here follows the, what's happening there, but you know the next to the opposition uh, ballot, uh, I mean, there, there is one identical with the, with the same, <laughs> saying the same thing, no, unidad and unidad, right? And, and so uh, I, I, they did that to Enrique Capriles in the last gubernatorial elections, and about, I don't remember exactly, but between one and two percent of the votes uh, went uh, mistakenly to that. So, so, so they are doing a lot of small things, uh, but it's, uh, uh, as, you, as you point out, it, at this point, the, the uh, what it will take to, you know, to make a, a massive fraud will basically require, I think, basically stopping the process. Uh, I mean, it's it's not something that you can easily do. Well, I'll have you react as, as well. But you know, is the is a massive fraud required? Because the rules are such that certain districts have more seats and weight than others. So you only just need to get a few more. You, you need to push the, the 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 scale a little bit more, and you really could get at least a small majority without massive fraud, even though, according to the polls, there's a huge difference. But that's not what's going to determine legislative elections. It's the structure in which the districts um, have been established. I have you to react to that. Well, it's uh, following up on, on Francisco uh, on Francisco's uh, answer, it's it's complicated. It's complicated because it's it's unpredictable what's going to happen. We, we could say, well, the opposition has a fair shot. The government should, being rational, uh, allow the opposition just to, you know, if it's to win, to win, and then, you know, the government still controls a lot of uh, other 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 instances. Uh, but it's not always rational, or at least it doesn't always appear to be a rational decision. Uh, so that 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 is aligned to what what, with what you had said about, you know, we do things as they go. There is a Venezolanismo that said. Uh, that says, you know, dale que no viene carro, you know, just go ahead because there are no car, cars, on, there, aren't, there aren't any cars coming, which is which it embraces that right, in a right. colloquial <laughs> way, and uh, and that and that is both a, 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 you know, some people are proud of it because that means that you're gutsy, and uh, but some people say, well, that that means that we we know how to do it, we know how to do things, and what the government has learned how to do is to maneuver many pieces at the same time. It's not just fraud the day of the election. Right. And actually, what's really interesting today, what's really interesting this week, and what helps this conversation greatly, is that the Secretary General of the OAS you know, wrote a, an 18-page long letter, very detailed, uh, on the many instances and many angles and many facets of, of, of that undermine the electoral uh, transparency. Ranging from what you said, you know, small margins of victory in certain jurisdictions, he says. Well, for example, there is a state of exception declared in certain territories of the country, in certain jurisdictions, where the government could potentially control, a, you know, public appearances or meetings. You would require an authorization to have a meeting of more than two people. A, and that could affect, you know, how political parties are gathering or organizing themselves. You know, there is a the government could go and search your house, and, and that intimidates opposition parties. And that what he suggests in his letter, he says, well, that per se doesn't make the government win, doesn't guarantee the government is going to have a, an electoral victory, but it's going to affect the opposition in a, in such a way that it could, you know, that they're they're going to be at a disadvantage. 
So there is that. There is the in interference of the courts that have either disenfranchised some key political leaders. That's, of course, intimidating. Uh, there is also the political discourse. There is the resources that are allocated in, in ways in which uh, you know, people who are allied with the government will have an unlimited amount of resources, whereas people in the opposition have to raise funds in a very difficult way. So, so it's complicated even to understand the magnitude of the, of, and also, you know, it's, it's really hard to point out to a single person, to the mastermind, you know, the Wizard of Oz that, that we could think, well, there's one person who's behind all this. Mm -hmm. Because there are all these independent agents, which happens in many instances of, of, of life, that would say, well, my allegiance to this cause is such that I will do what I think it's needed for the government to stay or my party to stay in power. And that doesn't necessarily goes back to Maduro or to TV Sai Lucena. There could be anybody who could say, okay, this is what I'm going to do to help secure this victory or help defeat the other side. So it's not, it's not black and white necessarily. Okay. Um, so Alejandro, you have a, a micro view of, of a lot of this. If you could just take us down to, right, to this level, right? and talk to us a little bit about that and particularly how it relates to this discussion that we're having. Yeah, um, let me just preface that maybe by just engaging in some of the um, comments that have been made already um, by saying something that perhaps might be unpopular, but the government actually has never really needed to engage in fraud, um, and what it, especially on Electoral Day, right? And there's a tremendous distinction between the process and the event. And for a variety of reasons, when you think about electoral legitimacy, electoral credibility, um, most of the discussion tends to happen on the event. Um, and then, you know, observers come, they, they, they count the ballots, they see that, you know, things happen, but of course they weren't there for the months previous. And this is exactly what Manuela is describing. Um, and so the, the unfairness, the, the kind of long-term fraud is the far more difficult, um, uh, uh, the far more difficult issue to, to get at in terms of what its outcome, how, what its outcomes are going to be. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, you know, the, to, to me, the, the issue isn't so much whether or not the government will engage in fraud or not engage in fraud in the electoral event, um, it's how it deals with a defeat, right? And it has shown itself to be very um, skillful and adept at dealing with defeat in a variety of ways. Um, uh, for instance, by stripping powers of those who have won, right? The you know the mayor of, of, of Caracas, Santo de Desma, when, when he won, they just sort of stripped him of powers and they created a superposition. Um, and this has been true throughout, um, you know, uh, uh, when, when they lost in 2007 with the Constitution reform well they just pushed it through um, the following year with a you know with a much different kind of um, procedural um, component right so you know the the, uh, the issue of dealing with a with a loss um, uh, isn't just about what happens during the event the bigger question is how the government will respond to it and that, I think that that's where we need to put our focus um, and it's especially true in this case because legislative elections in Venezuela and you guys can forgive me if, if I'm wrong right but you know, Venezuela is a hyper-presidentialist system, um, and the assembly has very few actual powers, although it can exercise some powers, especially if you have sort of a supermajority, which is what the opposition is going for. Um, but because it's this hyper-presidential system, you can imagine a multiplicity of ways in which uh, an eventual opposition victory could actually be stymied institutionally, right, um, uh, in ways that don't appear like fraud. Right, and so to some extent, I think that the question is slightly misguided. Right, will there be fraud or won't there be fraud? I think the government is making other bets and making other plans that don't really have to do with the the actual event. To be sure, and I don't want to minimize the tremendous symbolic effect that especially a huge electoral defeat would have, right? And in terms of setting itself up for um, you know for subsequent defeats, especially sort of uh, referendum if, if it's called in 2017 and uh, 2016. Um, but the specific question on the micro issue, so yes, thank you for the opportunity. So the book, um, is anybody here from Venezuela? Uh, is anybody, is, <laughs> nobody's perfect. Um, is anybody from Caracas? 
All right, so my book is a history of the 23 de Enero neighborhood, um, El 23, which for those who are not from Caracas or Venezuela is a uh, very distinctive neighborhood in Venezuela. It was founded in the mid-1950s under the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez as a, a response to a problem of squatter settlements in the, um, in the capital. Um, it's comprised of these super blocks, which you see here, 15 stories, uh, meant to sort of modernize both the landscape and the population at large. But then over the years, for a variety of reasons, you had a resurgence of these squatter settlements, these barrios, um, that now sort of, as you see in the image, this is, this is not juxtaposed, this is not superimposed, this is actually what it looks like, right? You have the combination of the informal settlements and you have the formal structures of the superblocks. And the larger argument that I make in terms of drawing out 50 years in the history of this neighborhood is that this built environment that incorporates both the informal and the formal is indicative of the broader ways in which Venezuelan politics actually flow when you look at them on the ground, especially in the pre-Chavez sort of Chavez era when we focus so much on the institutional solidity of the party system, um, on the institutional solidity of the oil industry, on the institutional solidity of leadership, um, uh, you know, sort of enlightened statesmen and other things. What was happening on the ground was actually far more messy, far more diffuse, far more of the interplay between these formal and informal processes that many times transcended institutionalism. And to some extent, very, to, to the point about how this incites on today, um, uh, uh, reflect upon the kind of informality that we see in the kind of governance style that both Chavez and, and Maduro kind of are playing on, right? So the, 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 um, uh, you know, the, the, the lack of knowing exactly what's happening, I think it reflects this larger process of understanding informality as the way in which politics happen, right? And so that's what we see emerging from the history of these, um, of these popular sectors. Um, the final point that I would make in terms of the elections, and um, you know, Francisco has been following the the, the circuit level uh, polls, um, and just a couple of weeks ago, you know, posted something which was really interesting, which is in the 23 de enero, actually the polls in the circuit that includes the 23 de enero show the opposition gaining and show the government losing, which is significant because the 23 has been seen um, over the last 15 years as a bastion of chavismo. Um, in fact, as I talk about in the book, um, the 23 has mostly been characterized by having a very kind of tenuous relationship with whichever government is in power, whether it was Perez Jimenez, which, whether it was Punto Fijismo, or even during Chavismo. Very interesting currents of dissent from within the um, from within the confines of the neighborhoods have been expressed. Here, though, it's something different. Here, the issue is, you know, let's just, uh, you know, if we're talking about aphorisms and, and, and whatnot, it's arrechera. Uh, it's sort of, you know, people are very upset um, at the everyday levels of corruption, at the inflation, primarily the inefficiencies of stateness, right? Um, and that's driving this tremendous degree of discontent, which is, you know, historical in nature. Thank you, uh, Alejandro. So, Francisco, I want to mention something because I've thought of something that, that Alejandro mentioned, which is, you know, let's assume that um, the opposition does win the National Assembly. But the way that it manages a loss is by before the new Congress comes in, it emasculates the institution, really making it lose power. Uh, it's done that before, as Alejandro, and it's very viable. It could probably do it. That, that is to say that the current National Assembly could essentially weaken itself before it leaves office. But to counter that, you know, that that was possible back when you know Chavez was around and there was a certain strength and, and support. But this is a very different Venezuela than we had you know that time. And it's a very polarized country. It's a country that even in 23 de Enero, it seems like they're losing support. Is that option, not that it's not possible, it is possible, but is it sustainable in this, in this environment? I think you make a very good point. Before going there, I want to just make the case uh, for a big victory of the opposition. I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about numbers. You know, the, the polls show, uh, and these are polls that, that were very accurate in the past, for example, in predicting the 2010 elections, like that analysis. The polls show basically a more than 30 point lead, 60 to 30 to simplify, some 63 to 28, some 65 to 30. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, the, the most consultor ventura, the one that used to give the opposition a bigger margin is now given the, the smallest margin, but it's still, uh, you know, a big margin. So if you, uh, it's, that's the general vote. And as, as, as we said, this is a circuit by circuit election. However, 
if you try to model how you translate those numbers, national numbers, into uh, circuits, uh, you uh, uh, come to the conclusion that the there is no way that the opposition will not have a big victory if those numbers reflect the final tally. Uh, I mean, let, let's talk about mechanics, right? I'm talking about, s say, the final tally of votes nationally is 60 to 30. How does that then translate right. into circuits? That, I think, will translate most likely into more than 100 deputies for the opposition. So it's at least 60%, which it's a super majority. It's not the big super majority, which is two thirds, yeah. but, it's, uh, but it's enough. And even there is the possibility of a two thirds super majority if, tho if those numbers uh, are, in, in fact, true. As Alejandro mentioned, we have some circuit by circuit polling. I'm not too uh, sure about uh, you know, this kind of polling in Venezuela because there is not a tradition of, 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 of that, and so the sampling might not be accurate. However, uh, in, in everything that I have seen, you see the same uh, big shift, very significant shift in regions that were strongholds of the Chavismo, including you know, this uh, circuit. We don't know if, if, the, uh, the, if the opposition is winning in El 23 de Enero. Exactly, we know that it's winning in the whole circuit. Uh, but but, but it, it's a major shift, because the, the government won by six points last time in that, in that circuit. Uh, th we see that the, government, the opposition is winning in all circuits of Caracas except one, which is Katia, next to El 23, uh, in which it's razor thin. It's like the, the government has like a three-point advantage or something like that. The government is losing like in Barinas, where the Chavez, you know, the the, 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 the the birthplace of the revolution or whatever. I mean, Chavez birthplace. So so it's pretty uh, amazing what we're seeing everywhere, and, and so I think there is a strong likelihood of a major victory. So I'm, then I go to to your point. If the, the victory is significant, I do agree that they will you know, uh, uh, prepare all these uh, strategies to try to minimize the role of the assembly. And there are plenty of those. I mean, the Constitutional Tribunal is full of uh, loyal Chavistas, and they have the ultimate you know, word in terms of saying, oh, no, this law is not you know, organic. This has to be done this way or this other way. You cannot appoint more judges because we say that it's unconstitutional. You know, there is, but at the end, as you pointed out in your question, you know, this is a very different scenario, right? All those things happened when the Chavismo was a majority, or, uh, uh, or almost half and half at some point, like in 2007. Uh, but this is a, a totally different scenario. In fact, you know, the, the, the popularity ratings, the approval ratings of Maduro are 20%, not even a third like the, the, like the voting intention. So, so in, this is a country that it's not that, that, that uh, you know, that the, 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 the opposition support has dramatically grown. It's more, mostly a voto castigo, but, but it's true that at this point, this is a, a government with very little uh, uh, support. They have something for them, which is that you know still the numbers of approval of Chavez are about 50 percent. Chavez. If, if you ask, uh, do you approve? Uh, oh, do you approve of Hugo Chavez in may, in different ways? The numbers go around, uh, and and you may think, well, what does it mean? The guy is not alive. Yeah, but you know, but it tells you a little bit like like Peronism in Argentina. You know, it's, that's why you see him in, everywhere. It, right? Exactly, yeah. it's a very powerful brand, Chavez. But no one in the Chavismo. Not, not Maduro, but not anyone else. Not Diosdado, not, no one has the numbers that, that the, the brand has. So, because people are really uh, uh, unhappy. Uh, so, I, I do think uh, that, that a major political, I mean, a major electoral defeat will be a major political defeat that might lead to some changes. Which changes, you know, we, we can Again, discuss. Again, it, 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 it would be a defeat um, for Maurismo. Will it be a defeat for Chavismo? I mean, that's the question. I think that's a that's a very good question, and I I don't. But as I said, I don't know who can inside right. the Chavismo claim the the mantle of of Chavez at right. the, at this point in a way that. But again, Manuel, um, assuming that they emasculate the national, that they weaken the national assembly, and the court rules that it's fine, is that measure sustainable? I mean, it was sustainable when they weaken the mayor. Different time. Would it? Can they get away with it politically over a period of time? Well, they have so far, you know, with, with things that were unthinkable, with, with moves that were unthinkable. People say, now another phrase that people used to use in Venezuela 10 years ago, 15 years ago, tenemos que tocar fondo, we have to get to the bottom. Fondo. We are at the bottom. <laughs> There's no bottom, really. There's no bottom. You know, in, you, you have to put yourself in the context, which, it, which I, I usually call take the bus. You know, take the bus and go around, and you see the context, the surroundings, and uh, and it's really bottomless. 
is really bottomless because the, the, the ramifications and the, and the possible combinations are, are really hard to you're put assuming a, put that the opposition will say, well, oh, they, they, you know, the well, opposition will like, simply accept? No, it will not. It will not. It will challenge it. Uh, there will be defeat, defeat after defeat by, you know, by virtue of court rulings. There might be indictments. There, ha there have been indictments in Venezuela on, you know, the indictments against Leopoldo Lopez, for example. People, any lawyer would say, oh, this is unthinkable. They don't have evidence. But it's not about evidence. It's not about what the rule says is about is about how this plays out in reality. Is the law in action what matters, not the law in the books? Can the court do it? The court should not do it, but it will do it. So the the, the point is that the there's so many pieces here, you know, and, and I don't want to sound like, like everything is relative, but but in a way it is. There are so many pieces, you know, the institutional arrangements or the way how the law in action operates it's so hard to, to predict how the different combinations are, how the judges are going to respond. The loyal judges will respond differently because they have different incentives also, personal incentives at the same time. Now there are all these scandals. You know, there's the drug trafficking scandal that, that you know, promises to, to create a ma major splash among political actors in Venezuela. That might sway some judges to, to show a a a allegiance or not. From unlikely events, there might come different combinations of who gets appointed, and then that person who gets appointed will vote in favor or against. So, so the bottom line, Francisco, uh, um, uh, Frank, is you're Francisco. You're Frank. <laughs> well, this is Francisco. You're Frank. So, so the bottom line is that uh, the, an, an opposition victory will be symbolically important. And I think that's undeniable. The symbolism attached to it. You know, in the country of symbolism, right? We were talking about the, the Chavez brand is, is, is a symbol that prevails. That would have a very powerful symbolic power, symbolic, you know, meaning. Whether that translates into a real change within a year or two years or five years, we don't know. It could help reconfigure the forces within the Madurismo and the Chavismo. It could probably show those hardcore Chavistas that Maduro was not right, and now we have to take charge of this situation. So that could that could that could translate into a harder a hard line of people that we don't know who they are at the moment, but would say, okay, now we're going to recoup, we're going to recuperate, we're going to revive the ideals of this revolution because you guys were not right. You were moderates, were not. It could lead to a compromise. It could lead to a negotiation. We don't know who is the nego who are the people at the table in the negotiation. It could lead to many things. So it's a game that is played by tactical after tactical moves and not necessarily by looking at a grand strategy. So, uh, Francisco, I'm going to come to you about the opposition. But first, um, Alejandro, first of all, I want you to react to, to what's been said. But uh, you, know, you have, as I said, a micro vision. I'm interested to see in if there is an opposition victory of some kind. Um, you know, the fear is uh, that, that the government will call out los círculos bolivarianos, las milicias, etc. 23, some of them in, in colectivos in the neighborhoods that you've that you've worked on. Has that changed? Will will these groups be more respond? Will be responsive to the government as they, I'm sure they were back when Chavez was around, or are they going to say, uh, will they will they remain on the sidelines? I think that it'll be well. Two things. Number one, it's going to be more wait and see than it. Um, the degree to which Maduro, in particular, exercises a command and control, especially over colectivos, is, I think, inflated. And for a variety of reasons, that's true. Even Chavez, actually, in colectivos in the 23 Senero, I mean, the most sort of famous, infamous one you want to call it, La Piedrita and Alexis Vive and others, um, Chavez would publicly come out and say, and castigate them, chastise them. Um, you call them anarchic groups when they sort of strayed the line, right? Um, 
so much so that you know one of the leaders of of, of La Piedrita, Valentin Santana, had to flee for a while because he was being sort of persecuted you know, from the government. You can imagine it, right? Um, and so you know the 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 chains, the institutional chains between the government per se, the institutional government, and the informal government, like the colectivos, is far more tenuous, right? And so um, the response is going to have much to do with in the event of an opposition victory, how the opposition behaves, not so much how the government behaves, right? And here's where Manuel's point is central. Um, certainly, these are the most radical, hardcore sectors, right? Um, they, they would welcome a weekend, even more weekend Maduro. Would they welcome it because they feel like now they can marshal their forces to put other people in place that um, right now Maduro is holding at bay? Um, who knows, right? So, um, so, so I guess what I would I would say is, you know, even if Maduro comes out and says, okay, unleash unleash them, unleash the colectivos, it's not entirely clear that people, you know, the colectivos would come out. And then what what would they actually do, right? Um, the target in 2014 was very clear: was people, you know, on the street, the you know, the, the guarimbas and whatever. Who would they, you know, who would they go out after in this case? Would be one question to ask. But to, to another point in terms of reacting to what's been said, um, in terms of, I like what you said about un, unthinkable scenarios, and we've sort of gone from unthinkable to unthinkable to unthinkable. Let me just post this unthinkable scenario, which is the opposition wins and the government accepts it and says, great, now you have control over the National Assembly. You are now partners in the mess that we have created. Right now, what are you going to do? What are your proposals? How likely you think that is that scenario? I actually think that is a highly likely scenario. Can you imagine coming into power at this stage and dealing with the levels of crisis that we have? I mean, I don't know any of you would want that job. I certainly wouldn't, right? And would you want the mood coalition, which is internally very sort of fractured, to figure out specific policy proposals, even something very concrete. What are you going to do with the foreigners, with the uh, you know, the exchange rate? Are you going to free it immediately, or are you going to do some sort of tiered arrangement? Presidential decision. He still owns it, right? That's fine. That's but you know, you have to if you if you're now controlling the National Assembly, you're going to be asked what this you know, uh, an answer to this question. What are you going to do with um, uh, the um, subsidies for gasoline? Are you going to get rid of them, or are you going to maintain them? What are you going to do with the misiones? Are you going to get rid of them, or are you going to keep them? Yes, you're right, they're presidential. But it puts the onus in a way that it hasn't been before um, uh, on an opposition now in some measure of power that it didn't have before, right? So, I mean, that's an unthinkable scenario, but I just want to pose it as thinkable. Okay, so Francisco, that's a great segue to the opposition. <laughs> um, so let's talk about those two scenarios. But but the the first scenario, um, the second scenario is the one that uh, Alejandro just just mentioned. The first scenario is, um, as we've talked about, the opposition wins, let's say by a hundred, uh, has a hundred seats, but the legislative legislature is emasculated, is weakened, doesn't have real much power authority. Does the what options does the opposition have? We saw the opposition at one point hit the streets massively, and then it kind of collapsed. Um, is this a different opposition? Is it organized different? Is it is it less impatient than it was before? Talk to us a little bit about this opposition in that in that scenario, yeah, particularly. It's, I mean, it's it's hard to. Uh, and by the way, it could be a mixed uh, masculating with uh, with the one that Alejandro mentioned is not totally. Uh, but I mean, let, let me talk a little bit about the opposition. You know, if you want to see the the, the, ga the glass half full, you can say that the Venezuelan opposition has accomplished things that uh, many of us thought will be very difficult to accomplish. I mean, if you compare the opposition, say in, in you know in Argentina, Bolivia, Nicaragua, uh, Ecuador, with the Venezuelan opposition, the Venezuelan opposition accomplished something that none of those other uh, uh, oppositions in similar contexts uh, could achieve, which is uniting, uh, having a totally uh, unified coordinating uh, mechanism and one single candidate uh, per circuit uh, with a few exceptions of uh, you know, very minor exceptions uh, and one list for, for the whole country and in fact even one, just one party uh, label for, uh, for it. Uh, so that's a, a, a major accomplishment. It is 
a product of the tremendous incentives to, to do it because otherwise, you know, uh, the, 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 it's a very majoritarian system in Venezuela. So if you, uh, I, I, I mean, if, if, if you get, you know, uh, the opposition fragmented, they will massively yeah. lose. The, the, so so a, lot of, uh, a lot of it has to do with the incentive. But in any case, they, 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 they were able to figure it out. It took a while, but they, they did it. Uh, uh, and so some uh, might argue that the Venezuelan opposition is in many ways ahead of, 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 of others in the region uh, in, in, that, in that regard. However, uh, it is pretty much uh, a very fragmented uh, uh, group of, of, of individuals. By the way, if they win by a very large margin, uh, they will have different sort of challenges to, to, to keep united than if they had a, a smaller margin. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and you have uh, uh, clearly... I mean, it's not as much an ideological divide. I think the opposition, uh, even though it has, uh, you know, people from the left and center and, and, and right, the, the, the biggest divide is, is on a strategy of how to, you know, to pursue the regime change or, or, or a transition. Uh, the more moderates uh, want something that is more negotiated and that, uh, uh, you know, uh, doesn't uh, go directly to a, 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 a you know, a, a sort of a, a collapse of the regime because they, they think that might uh, actually, you know, uh, entrench uh, a lot of, of the Chavistas and make uh, and uh, will generate a lot of instability. Uh, whereas the other, the, the more sort of uh, uh, impatient, if you want to call them, or, or, or whatever, or confrontational, uh, uh, have the notion that you can actually, uh, you know, get rid of, of, of the Chavismo uh, uh, once and almost for all. Uh, maybe it's an exaggeration, but I think there are some people that, that seem to think that way. And, and so I think that uh, division will materialize tremendously in what is the strategy. So, and the government then can play, if they are smart, the kind of strategy that Alejandro was mentioning, trying to, to, to lure them into saying, okay, so now we have to approve the budget, right? And so what are, you, what are your priorities? And, and oh, it's the, it's the opposition's fault that we are not being able to fund the mission, whatever, because they, they change our budget, things like that. I think the... the, 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 the like their MO, right? Yeah. They're not that strategic. Not so far, right. yeah. Well, it's true, but, 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 but it, might, it might, you know, it, it, the, the thing is that no one wants to own the, the economic crisis. As you pointed out, it's, it's clearly in the hands of the executive, the time bomb, right? And so I, I totally agree. I mean, if I was the opposition I was, and I was uh, offered, uh, you know, power <laughs> today, I would say, no, no, thank you. You know, it's, uh, I mean, the, the Venezuela requires a massive adjustment, and, and so you, you broke it, you own it, right? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 they, they should pay the, the, the political cost. They are paying them, but, but anyone who tries to do uh, some adjustment now will pay additional, additional costs. Uh, uh, although I have to say that one of the, 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 I mean, it's very important that the economic context of this story, you know, it, it, Venezuela had a major crisis before the collapse on the price of oil, right? Because the government overspent like crazy to win the 2012 elections, created all these macroeconomic imbalances, and had the, the highest deficit in the history of the republic at the time of the highest oil price, which is amazing, no? Uh, but, but now we have, on top of that, a collapse of the price of oil that was so fast and so deep that is higher than the one we had in the 80s, uh, in terms of, you know, if you look at the, the magnitude and time. And the 80s brought the Caracaso, uh, uh, brought the, the coups, uh, the military coups against, against uh, uh, Perez. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that just gives you an idea of the massive uh, uh, instability that the country could face in the following years if the economic uh, adjustment happens or not. So it's a very tricky thing, you know. The, the, the opposition, some people in the opposition will want to rush particularly if they win by a very large margin, they will want to rush to a constitutional assembly, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the nuclear bomb of the yeah. Venezuelan constitution. Right. Basically, yeah. you, you know, and constitutional assembly can basically close every other power uh, in, 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 the, in, in the country, according to the Venezuelan constitution. It requires 67 percent? Uh, yeah, uh, two-thirds, uh, uh, to, to convoke it directly without, you know, without a referendum or any. I mean, they have to go to a referendum, but they don't, they don't, they don't need, like, collect uh, signatures or anything. Uh, so, um, uh, so I think it will be very, very, very difficult with a, such a divided opposition and one of the main leaders in the opposition being in prison. So, so one, uh, one uh, sort of easy thing that we will all expect is that there's going to be a law, uh, amnesty law, that, that will be the, almost the first law approved by the new uh, assembly, and they, they will uh, basically ask for uh, Leopoldo Lopez to get out of jail. And that. So, so that, I think the initial 
part of the game would be very political. It would be these kind of things and not the eco economic part. And they will say to the government, as I said, you, know, you take care of the, the gasoline price. We, we are not going to, to, to even talk about that. Okay, we're getting ready to uh, give you all the mic, so uh, please start formulating your questions or comments. Let me ask a, a quick question of Manuel and Alejandro, if I could ask you to respond uh, briefly. And that is, you know, the uh, political scientists like to talk about elite defection, right? That is to say, when the regime, members of the regime, those it, particularly in the inner circle, decide, you know what? This is this is this is all going wrong. I'm getting the hell out, right? And so it begins to split and really begins to weaken and fall apart. Is that a possibility? Do you see that happening uh, at least below the surface? Could you see that happening after the election, um, Manuel? The people defeating, defecting, uh, defecting, the, defecting, defecting. Sorry. Okay. Well, we yeah, but depends. You know, again, you know, it depends on the particular circumstances. Some some have defected. Because they have, they have, uh, they have become very uncomfortable in the eyes of others. Some are intimidated. Some are the holders of information that they think, you know, it's going to help them negotiate or blackmail. Uh, some have, uh, you know, have have fell, fallen in disgrace. Um, so, so, so that has happened, but for different reasons. But the hardcore political actors, the ones who, who feed or who, who depend, whose, whose livelihood, and it's not money or corruption or anything, whose livelihood depends on, whose life depends on their political presence, will not leave. You know, when you are committed to a political cause. They will go you, down with a sinking ship. You will go ship. down, you will stay, you will, you be, because probably we don't think, we were talking about, about political leadership uh, on the way uh, uh, up here. And, and about how, you know, it appears that certain uh, very significant political actors or, or political figures in history have been risk takers. They don't, they, you know, from the outside, because none of us is one of them. None of us is, 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 uh, is even, you know, entertaining a political career, at least I'm not. Uh, we are risk averse. Or we think, you know, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But they don't. And, you know, think about Chavez. You know, how many times Chavez challenged the establishment, even against the advice of his, of his people, and did things that, you know, at the time we don't know if it was a master plan or if it was just a hunch or if it was just that he woke up one day and said, you know, this is what I'm going to do today, and I don't care what people think about it. So, so, of course, Chavez is one extreme, but then you have a lot of people in between the normal citizen and, and, and that, that top political leader who are going to stay, who own the process, who own the revolution, who think that these 15 years or so have been, have been worthwhile. So the struggle, and, and this is one of the things that, that, that is really interesting about this process, which is part of, this, of the brand, is that this is a struggle. This is a long-term battle. What really made, made, made me think and pause when people would say, oh, this was going to last six months. This is back in 2003, 2004. Oh, this is over, was the, that the political discourse that came from the top was telling people, this is a long-term battle. Our children might not see the results of this revolution. So that, that gave people the strength to keep fighting. Fighting for what? You know that probably gets reconfigured over time, but it's it's difficult. Once once people create the sense of loyalty with a cause, it's hard to detach them from yeah, it. Right. People will not ordinary citizens. You know, some of our relatives, I'm sure, will not leave Venezuela, even if they don't have any food, because they will not leave their country, and they are not political actors at all. So imagine if you have a, a stake in the political battle. Of course, you it's it's unthinkable for you to move an inch. Okay. Anyway. That, that, was, that was really well said. I guess the only thing that I would add is, um, well, I guess two things. Number one, 
And it's precisely at those levels, at sort of the very local levels, right, where there's a very perceptible sense of, well, fine, we're not as bad as we used to be. And there's also, once you have that attachment to a cause, you can always find someone else to say, this is the problem. It's not the, it's not the cause itself. Something else is interfering with the, with the way in which it's, it's manifesting. It might be, you know, a corrupt official. It might be el imperio. It might be whomever, right? So the cause is sort of always there, and you can always come back to it. Which I think speaks to the point that Francisco had made, um, and we were trying to get at, which is, you know, how to read December sixth is going to be as important as what actually happens, right? And so, if you read it as a voto castigo, it's very different from reading it as an opposition victory. If you read it as a rejection of Maduro and Madurismo, it's very different from reading it as a, re as a rejection of Chavismo. Um, and uh, you know, I, th I think that I don't know if it's a trap. I don't. Um, and if I suggested this, I, I, I'd like to backtrack it. I don't think this is a strategic vision on the part of Maduro to say, this is, this is how we're going to lure the opposition. And I think actually it's the most, um, uh, you know, it, it, to me it seems like the most rational thing to do, <laughs> um, uh, to just say, fine, you own it as well as, as we are, um, rather than to, you know, have sort of this grand design. But if, 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 you, spe if you see it as a rejection of Maduro, then it actually opens doors for the longer term vitality of something that people imagine as Chavismo, as a movement, as Peronismo, right? And here's where you would find the sort of the jumping of ships, the, the elite defection. You might have that elite defection, but it would be sort of a lateral defection. It won't be a defection you know, to an opposition, it might be a lateral defection to some other current that imagines itself as sort of the bearer, the standard, right, the standard bearer of Chavismo. Um, and, and that's how it might play out, right? Not a, you know, complete sort of a, because again, it's it, Venezuela, we, we like to say that it's polarized, and we always like to say that it's polarized, but it's never really quite been polarized except for like electoral events, which are by nature polarizing. But when you think about numbers and people's allegiances, they're transactional, uh, especially sort of big levels in the middle. Um, uh, and within the opposition, there's a tremendous amount of you know, you know, diffusion and the rest of it, right? So it's not quite the, now I'm going to jump ship to the opposition. Well, which opposition are you going to jump ship to, right? Um, and you know, that's going to you know, measure out how... Um, you know, how people respond. Okay. Questions, comments from the audience? Sally, we got one right here. Just uh, identify yourself and ask the question. Um, my name is Joaquin. I'm a student here, at a grad student here at FIU. And my question is mostly for Alejandro, but, but for everyone too. I'm kind of interested in this, this idea of the an opposition victory actually being a propaganda coup for Maduro, you know, because you could see how it'll lend legitimacy. You know, they can't accuse him of being a dictator and, and this this sort of thing. Pass the onus on to the opposition for governing. And I want to ask how that kind of propaganda coup will play into uh, the strategy, the political strategy of the Chavista base. Um, I know there are strong tendencies within the Chavista base towards a kind of decentralized model, right? Barrio organizing, stuff like that. Um, and Chavez many times um, encouraged this, right? Really famously in a speech, he, he invoked Kropotkin, of all people, <laughs> in his right. speech. And, you know, So I found that very interesting. So I'm, so I'm interested in how the Chavista base, especially in the barrios, would would kind of appropriate this, quote, propaganda coup, if you think, indeed, it's a possibility? Yeah, that, what a, that's a phenomenal question. Um, uh, I actually hadn't thought of it as a propaganda coup, but it is entirely what it would be. Um, the kind of deep-seated, long-running um, disconnect, especially between Maduro and the, the, the bases, has some to do with the charisma and the lack of it, has some to do with the improvisational na nature, but it has really a lot to do with the, um, for a variety of reasons, Maduro's conflicting tendency to centralize further and at the same time to allow for some experimentation at the local level. That is exactly where the bases find the most degree of opposition to Maduro, right? They just don't believe that he's on board with the plan to bring lo poder local, poder comunal, poder, you know, um, uh, poder popular. Um, 
And so they might actually read this precisely as an opportunity. Um, in the same way that they read the, the, 2000, you know, 2000 and, um, uh, the 2010 defeats that they, they undertook in the, um, as a sort of a rejection of the idea that we need to move towards a more centralized model. In fact, what we're actually, we can use this voto castigo as an opportunity to actually send a message, right? So that's, that's entirely possible. Um, I don't think that it would be, you know, I don't think that it would be uh, a death knell at all. In fact, I think it might actually encourage and embolden some of these popular sectors to say, we were right. This is the, the move that we need to take. What I think was Manuel was saying. We need, this is, the fact is that you strayed from the path rather than um, cemented it. And that's what we you know, need to, to move forward on. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's interesting that you have a vacuuming book. Uh, well, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the, I think it's, uh, you know, it's true that as the referendum in 2007, as Chavez, even though the next day Chavez said that, you know, that it was a, a victory and he described it in, in on, on mentional uh, ways, uh, it, it, basically he, he did say, you know, uh, I'm a Democrat. I, uh, I lose and I accept uh, uh, when I lose. So there will be some degree of legit legitimacy if the government uh, accepts uh, uh, um, uh, a defeat. However, you know, I think I think two things will happen. There, there will be, a, I think, a big defeat, but there will be a lot of electoral irregularities to try to get some. So, so I'm not so sure that it will, uh, they, they will uh, come out smelling out of roses. However, uh, I do think that the, the bigger news will be the big political you know, uh, defeat. This is a, a, you know, a, a revolution that, that uh, was supposed to be supported by the people. And then when you uh, have, you know, almost two-thirds of the people, you know, uh, uh, turning against you. I think that's a major, major, major blow to them. Uh, I think uh, it's so big that I think it will, I mean, I think it's totally unpredictable because we have, as we have discussed, you know, it's so difficult to, to know, you know, the role of the military, the role of the, of these entrenched groups, the, 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 the ones that have, you know, uh, a lot of skin in the game because they are in, involved in narco trafficking and things like that. So it's a very complex story with even international dimensions, as we know. Uh, uh, but if they uh, do lose by a, such a big margin, I think it, it, it is a, uh, it's something that, that, that well played will probably lead to a transition. It could be, you know, Maduro, uh, uh, you know, being the one thrown under the bus and someone else from the Chavismo uh, 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 getting into power. But any scenario will be very, I think, uh, unstable and, and difficult to, to sustain. And an anecdote um, from, from the book. So, um, uh, so something really interesting happened in 2005, which I recount in detail, which was, um, you know, the, re the recall referendum had happened. Um, the opposition was a total disarray. Chavismo was really ascendant. Chavez himself was very ascendant. And the next scheduled elections were um, uh, local elections for, uh, for uh, concejales, for, for mayors, and the rest of it. Um, this was in 2005. Um, feeling emboldened, um, Chavez, in, to the micro level question, Chavez imposed candidates on the 23 de enero, sort of uh, neighbor, like the parish, parish um, uh, offices. And neighborhood groups rebelled. They said, this is not what we signed up for, for you telling us who our representatives are going to be. And so what they did is they organized autonomously and outside of the sort of regular process, uh, local level primaries, the first of its kind at the parish level. And all sort of the, the neighborhood groups got together, including colectivos and others, um, and they put up their candidates. And eventually those candidates were the ones that sort of went forward. And then once Juan Barreto was elected, he tried to put um, a person from uno de sus allegados as jefe civil of the parish. And they rebelled against him. And they put on their own jefe civil, right? Um, and so, you know, there, there's lots of experience of, you know, straying from the party line. And this is a moment ripe for that. 
how, whether it's going to manifest itself nationwide, that's a very difficult story. And, you know, what I develop in the book is this tension. You know, 23 is a very exceptional place for a variety of reasons. It's symbolically very powerful. It's spatially very central in terms of its actual configuration. It brings together these formal and informal elements. And that's not replicated easily er elsewhere in the country, right? But it does have a, a sort of a, a national projection that has an influence in other popular sectors, right? And so um, if it follows in this way, um, you might find a, a, a sort of spillover effect. Question down here as well. Former student. Yes. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, my name is Orchun Sarchuk. I'm also a political science PhD student. Uh, from my own understanding of elections in Venezuela, it all turns into a plebiscite about the leader in the end, rather than discussing about the policies, discussing the vision of the opposition. So do you think by turning all elections into a plebiscite on Chavez or Maduro, do you think the opposition also helps the incumbent government? Because the opposition cannot come up with its own vision apart from being united against Chavez or Maduro. That's one of the biggest challenges of, of the opposition. The opposition in Venezuela is fighting against the brand, mm -hmm. against the symbol. It was for the longest time fighting against the color red. Mm -hmm. So the, the power of the Chavismo was, was such, and is still such, that owned a color, owned a symbol, owned, owned a speech. So anything that anybody said had to compete with, and Capriles tried to, Try to become more palatable to the rest of even he even changed the way how he how he spoke with people how he addressed people to to and I'm sure you know his advisors would tell him you know to talk more like the people less like 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 a Caracas uh, race you know nice guy and more like people from the provinces and all that so the, so the big challenge for the opposition has been and will be as long as the brand lasts to to fight in a terrain where the rules are dictated by the establishment. And this is all about this long-term plan, revolution, a revolutionary plan, and that's the terrain where everybody is trying to, to fight for. It's not about a specific policy, it's not a, everything else becomes secondary. It's about seizing power first and then trying to figure out what to do. So it's a very it's a very unusual well it's probably not unusual it has I'm sure it has happened in, in other places but it's very inefficient too it's very expensive for all those involved the government spends and spends and spends on it to preserve the brand so it seems irrational to someone to an outsider thinking well all this process is just to preserve you know to to perpetuate some some idea that there's going to be a change, there's going to be a change, but this is probably how these regimes last. They need, you, need to, you need to infuse it with more symbols and more symbols so it, it perpetuates itself. Hi, uh, my name is Alberto Vilagut. Uh, it's more than a question or comment. You guys put all the scenarios outside uh, to a table, but the only thing I kind of wonder is that Diosdado Cabello's role was never mentioned on the possible scenarios. And my question is that, the, for me, the declaration of President Maduro that has been the most, wor the, the worst one, is that he said that he's going to have a civic military and that if he has to put the revolution in a new phase, he's going he's gonna to do it. If the, co if the government loses the, the Congress, Diosdado Cabello is not the president anymore. So how do you think his role is going to play out? That's a very difficult one. I think that the, one of the things that I'm predicting is that Diosdado Cabello is not going to be the president of the National Assembly in January of next year. Uh, what, where will he you know, move to? Uh, one hypothesis is that he will uh, become vice president uh, because he's so powerful that Maduro will have to recognize uh, uh, him there. Uh, some other people believe that, 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 that that's not going to be the case. You know, it's extremely hard to uh, understand uh, sort of the, the loyalties. One thing we know about Maduro, Maduro has much more military people in government than Chavez. 
uh, so he's relying much more on, on the military as an institution uh, uh, than Chavez because he he's weaker and and so he relies uh, on them uh, more. Uh, but it's not clear at all that that you know that Diosdado represents the military. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, factional divide. We see all the time now this uh, uh, former uh, you know Minister of the Interior uh, Rodriguez uh, Torres, uh, Miguel Rodriguez Torres. You know, tweeting and, and saying that that he's trying to take the mantle of Chavismo, uh, uh, and, uh, and and so he he might you know play the the if, if they have a big defeat, saying okay you know these guys uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, but he will go against I think both uh, both Maduro. guys, uh, both Maduro and, and Cabello. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure what, what role uh, Cabello will ultimately play. He he has he is a very Unusual guy in the sense that he's extremely powerful uh, in, in many ways because of his. He, he, if you sort of see the map of people in government, you see uh, Cabello's uh, uh, fingerprints like in half of the government. Uh, on the other hand, his popularity is extremely low. His negatives, I think, are the highest that any politician probably has ever had in Venezuela. Uh, 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 he lost to, to Capriles. He, he, he almost, you know, he, he almost lost inside the party, uh, you yeah. know. Uh, so, so he, he's, he's not popular even, even inside the party. So, um, uh, so, so that's sort of a, a difficult p position to be in. He has sort of a lot of uh, factual power, but not necessarily a, a lot of political electoral capital. Uh, so uh, I have to say that I, I don't know exactly how, how, how that's going to uh, play, but I, I, I do think that he will not be the president of the National Assembly. Hi, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, my name is Kevan Antonio. I represent uh, Reporters Without Borders for the Caribbean region, and I'm also doing some research on Venezuela. Two things I wanted to ask about. Um, First of all, it seems like Pedevesa is a power center. Cabello has his own power center. The army, whoever can control that, will be able to wield some power. And then whoever has, in a fractional environment, that you, from what you describe, it almost seems like anarchy, because uh, I'm not sure who will be able to impose something on these elections. But whatever happens. We'll see. We'll see as as this landscape changes. I wanted to ask about this: the Cadivi fraud, the fraud of Cadivi. Uh, did you think that Barroso had a power center there, or he was just uh, somebody implementing the access to the dollars? And then the other thing is this: in a landscape where every message is interpreted through the prism of whichever party or m messenger you believe, who? Is an ind who has credibility with both sides, with either side in Venezuela these days? Who has is there an independent institution that has credibility in Venezuela, independent of the messenger and the message where it comes from? Alejandro, why don't you take the second part of the question and then that was clear. Was that? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, the first part on the Cadivi stuff, I'll leave to Cadivi people. I don't know <laughs> uh, people who know the economy more than me. Um, so, okay, let me see. So, um, an institution that can mediate between a very riven, in a riven political landscape. Um, I mean, if you think about sort of polls, then you know the Catholic Church still has some some credibility, and um, uh, you know some media has credibility, but the media landscape is so you know tenuous, especially in sort of audiovisual. Um, if you think about sort of political leaders that can straddle a divide, um, I've sort of long been bullish on a couple of people, but in particular, Henry Falcón has some really interesting um, sort of local level support um, in, in terms of thinking about discourses and sort of appearances and performances actually does have a very um, appealing kind of popular narrative. But he's also distrusted by some of the more hard, hardcore elements of, Chav of the opposition because he used he was the, he's the he's the governor of of Lara, of Lara State, um, and he you know he's exercised sort of moderate positions um, uh, you know over the, the last few years and he you know he's one of three opposition governors in the country and, and he's very popular, um, and so he he sort of strikes that balance of in some ways being hated by radicals on both sides 
which can maybe sort of play towards the middle in a context where a political landscape allows for some transactional play, um, which is one of the possible scenarios after 6, 6D. But of course, you know, I think depending on the scale of the victory, it might actually give rise to the more sort of radical voices. Um, I think my you alluded to earlier, like gloom and doom scenarios. I, I mean, I think that um, I'm sort of straddle this place between, on the one hand, being thinking about it very strategically, and then on the other hand, actually seeing it on the ground very riven, anarchically, or whatever you want to call it, right? And between those two, it's a cauldron. It's a, it's a tinderbox. I tell you, listening to you, uh, I'm pessimistic. Um, regardless of this election, right? Regardless of the results of this election, the way you describe sort of this very tenuous, they're on their own, a sort of rogue, they don't pay attention to the opposition, they don't care much for the government, they care, you know, they didn't pay attention to Chavez, they can just do their thing, right? So there is a, you describe nivel de ingobernabilidad, right? Where it, 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 it it's a little... Um, yeah, it's a little scary. It's it's a, it's a gobernabilidad that's not institutional. Yeah. It's an experiential gobernabilidad, which I think scares us, and it should scare us, especially if we're institutionalists. Um, yeah, just very briefly, one of the really amazing things about the Venezuelan story over the last 16 years is that many other countries in Latin America, many other countries in the world, with similar levels of you know hyperpolarization. Um, have much more quickly descended into open conflict, war. That Venezuela hasn't gotten there, um, and every time they're sort of moving towards that edge, there seems to be a pullback, actually speaks very positively to deep wells of what, you know, if you want to think about it in political science terms or sociological terms of like social capital um, that's that, that remains in Venezuela. And I think it does from these experiential ex you know, moments of, um, or, you know, histories, part of which I describe here, of knowing that, you know, the alternative, that alternative is not a road that we're willing to take. Um, but yeah, on the ground, it actually does look very messy. I'd like to interject with, uh, there's one word that you used that I, that I think uh, does not reflect what happens in Venezuela, although we, we tend to suggest that there's anarchy. And there's no anarchy. It's unpredictable, you know, it's, it's interesting, your, your label, and I like it, you know, this experiential uh, uh, thing, because, we, you know, we're not, there's no, there's no playbook for this. There is no, there is no process. There is no clear process, you know. In a, in in a, a, that's why the rest of the world, the planned world, the world that likes to plan ahead, you know, it's puzzled. It's like, well, there's anarchy. It's a disaster. It's not. It's like a big bazaar. It's like a big bazaar where everything is negotiated. This you, is new for Venezuela, well, no? I, I don't think it's new for Venezuela. I think it's new at this level of 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 having to negotiate so often. For example, one of the one of the institutions that I have analyzed is the court system, and during the 80s and the 90s, Venezuela, more, mostly the 80s, more than the 90s. The 90s were were somewhat different. The 90s were a transition period. The court system, which you you know you read any literature that, that talks about institutions at the time, you know that's the, that's when the World Bank started looking at institutions and building the rule of law and all that. There was this 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 perception, well not perception, more reality then the way how the courts worked in Venezuela was because there were these so-called judicial tribes, tribus judiciales, mm -hmm. which were groups of, of you know, networks of powerful lawyers. Were, which, th these were political brokers that would you know, have some ends, insiders, a power on you know, the appointment of judges. So there were two or three political actors who would be you know, influential on how the judges decide. So if you wanted, if you if you were involved in a dispute that had a, was was a high stake dispute, you would go to the La Tribu de David, which is a, how Morales Bello, which is you know one of the political actors, you know, had a tribe, or El Clan Borsalino, which was another tribe, and these were well known networks of lawyers that negotiated in the courts. Then Chavez makes it well. There's a transition, and then Chavez makes the tribes, the tribe culture disappear in a way. But it gets replaced by something similar to that. 
The only problem is that, is that before, the rules were somewhat clear to the actors, not to an outsider. If you were an American lawyer with a Venezuelan client, you would not understand how this worked. If you were a Venezuelan lawyer with a Venezuelan client, everybody knew what, what had to be done. What and, the team right. And it was, there was clarity. There was predictability for the actors. Unspoken rules, but rules nonetheless. What happened then with Chavez is that the rules shift to a certain way. And what happens now, now getting out of the court system and thinking in terms of, of, of governability of the country, is that there are these negotiations that happen more often than they used to happen because it's less predictable. There are centers of power, as in the, the, the metaphor of the bazaar that I use, is, is applicable here because, you know, you have the one who sells the vegetables and the one who sells the meat, and you have the other one who controls the territory where the little vendors are, and now they have, they used to have to meet every five years or every year, now they have to meet every week. So all these negotiations occur on a daily basis. I think the, the breaking point is when there is, uh, chaos breaks when, when one of these actors decides to pull out, says, I don't play anymore, and that hasn't happened. We don't know when that will happen. We don't know who will, who will get out of the table. But what, what, what seems to be happening increasingly is that there are, there's this negotiated reality, this experiential, going back to how you started the conversation tonight. Let's see how it goes. And that is a constant in Venezuelan, not only politics, but in Venezuelan you know, in social behavior. That's how communities get organized. They say, we don't need to have rules written on the wall. We all know how, what the rules are. And you know, if you don't know what the rules are, we'll create new rules and we'll adapt. It's a highly adaptable uh, type that, of That, by the way, is exactly Sorry. the argument of my book. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> you haven't read it yet. And you just, right. uh, just bought it. Just bought it. Super plug. I, I want to just to mention on the issue of who, who might be, you know, there are people clearly positioning themselves in this space of being sort of, you know, neutral, potentially transitional. Uh, one clearly is Henry Falcon. He has he has been very careful, methodical at, you know, being inside the mood, but uh, from time to time dissenting from the mood, accepting uh, uh, the you know meetings with Maduro uh, uh, before anyone else, and saying that he's sort of positioning himself as some, someone that is not, you know, uh, I, I, he, he never, I think, said, I don't think he has said that he, had, that he, that he still a chavista in the sense of being part of the, of the, of the movement. But I think it's, it won't be hard for him to sort of reclaim that he's in that uh, world. And he has been very uh, effective at sort of ally, uh, so, sort of form an alliance with some people in the mood in the more moderate side, like uh, you know, social democrats, UNET. Uh, um, um, and so, so he, he's clear, clearly playing that strategy. I think he will be difficult as a transition, uh, uh, you know, potential transition president, for example, because I think he has so much support and so that, that he, he could stay there. He, you know, all other rivals might say, no, this is not a guy that we can accept as a transitional guy because he will stay. You know, he, he will he will become a uh, uh, exactly. So, so in that sense, but but he I think does fulfill sort of the checklist that the Chavismo will accept Henry Falcon as someone uh, that will sort of not be such a big threat for them. It's, it's someone that has been, uh, you know, sort of in a way a relative of the family. Uh, there are other people positioning themselves like that uh, uh, in a different sort of way. Uh, one is Eduardo Fernandez, former leader of, of COPE, who has uh, uh, systematically also tried to, uh, to, to uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to <laughs> uh, he, he has to try to position himself in, into someone that is, uh, you know, someone that the Chavismo will uh, accept. And he does fit the role of a transitional president in the sense that he, no, he doesn't have any pol popularity or pol political capital, so no one, no one believes that he might, he, he's not as threatening. Uh, some people even uh, talk about, you know, Jose Vicente Rangel, uh, 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 which is uh, like an octogenarian. I don't know how, how old is uh, Jose Vicente because uh, uh, that many plastic surgery it makes it difficult to, to assess. But, 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 but he clearly it's, it's one of those uh, uh, people that, that, that has also uh, uh, set himself uh, uh, for, for being a pro power broker in, 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 in some situations. So, so there are some people playing that, that kind of, uh, uh, of interim 
president or transitional government kinds of strategy. We have time for one more question. One question. Hi, uh, my name is Salim Daher. I'm a political science and economics student here at FIU. And um, I know I'm wearing a jacket very similar to that of Diosdado Cabello, but this is the jacket of the Venezuelan <laughs> Olympic team, so I think we all have a right to wear it. So you run as fast as Cabello? I run faster. <laughs> 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 um, my question is, in a regarding a hypothetical scenario of the opposition winning the elections, do you really uh, do you really think change might might be exerted after this? Uh, come January 5th, the first um, general assembly of of our parliament comes to session. Uh, what do you believe might be the action, the course of action to take? Should um, they go for a recall referendum once and for all? Should a national constituent assembly be called for? Or should they just roll with the punches until 2019? Why don't I give each of you a couple of minutes uh, so that we can close. Francisco. No, actually. This is the closing, right? It's the closing. Why not? Okay. Since we went, sorry, we yeah. start with Alejandro back. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so, so the first thing that they'll do, as uh, Francisco suggested, is this amnesty law. But even, this is one of the really interesting things, that even within the context of an amnesty law, at least what I've been reading, there's disagreement as to who exactly counts as a political prisoner. Um, so, for instance, some people say that Loren Sale should be among the counted, and some people say that he shouldn't, right? And so that already shows some, you know, some, some factions, which would be interesting to see how they pursue that particular question. Right, because that, for instance, will speak, will send a signal as to you know who we imagine as nuestros and, and who we imagine as not nuestros. In terms of scenarios for constituent assembly or, re or recall referendum, um, that's going to depend a lot on on what Diosdado ends up doing, right? Because you know if you go for a recall referendum, then what the constitution says is that the person that then comes to power, if the, they lose the recall, would be the vice president. And so, you know, <laughs> if the Ozawa is there, I'm not sure this is a move that they would want to take. Um, so, you know, how they play that particular scenario in terms of all the interplay of, of particular tactics. And the final thing in terms of the constitutional referendum, I totally agree with Francisco. I mean, that is sort of the nuclear option. Um, interestingly, I imagine that that's actually not that of a well, in so many words, descabellada, um, you know, option because it would actually allow for a, um, a a place where these local constituencies that are very upset but not in line with the opposition might actually have a say in rearticulating what they imagine to be the true direction of the country. Um, it's going to present some challenges for the opposition because, you know, for many years, a big part of the um, uh, uh, opposition discourse is the major weakness of the government is that it just hasn't followed its own constitution, right? And so you can't, on the one hand, say, well, we're sort of apegados a la constitución, and on the other hand, say, well, we want to get rid of it and start something new. That will smell like, well, return to punto fijismo, and that would be a problem. I'd say roll with the punches, <laughs> and uh, and roll with the punches, meaning that there all there are these options on the table, and uh, different alternatives will arise depending on the circumstances. We don't know who the decision makers are going to be. We assume that we know that there are some this this monolithic figures that will that have have influence all the time. They probably want, you know, this going back to the different centers of power, going back to the events that affect the credibility of the government. You know, now the government is 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 fighting all these all these in all these fronts. You know, one of the, the big scandals the involving Celia Flores's uh, nephews, uh, the government has 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 downplayed it, but but it's not is not to be downplayed. And that's something that's gonna be in the news for a little while. You know, there will be a hearing in a court in New York, there will be a lot of ammunition to talk about the government and, and who knows who else is going to be indicted in the U.S. and who knows who else is going to be indicted in Venezuela mm -hmm. as a result of this. So, so rolling with the punches is not necessarily talking about a government that is completely uh, improvised because that rolling with the punches is part of, a, is part of the, 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 the strategy. You know, we know this is what we do. Depend, we reassess the situation. Going back to, you know, renegotiating 
more often than it used to be during negotiated. I think it's uh, it's it's a very difficult. I mean, if I was in the position of, of deciding these things, I, I think it will, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, what strategy to follow in terms of which you know type of transition you want to pursue? I think the Constitutional Assembly is a very. It's like a Pandora's box. It's a very difficult. I mean, it can uh, you know. Typically, constitutional assemblies either were pre-negotiated, like the 61 in you know in, in, in Venezuela, in the sense it wasn't a constitutional assembly, it was Congress, uh, for, and, and it was sort of part of the Pacto Punto Fijo in the sense that the Acción Democrática allowed themselves to be, even though they were the majority, they not they didn't use their majority. They they, they basically uh, gave the others uh, a, a role that 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 wasn't uh, necessarily what the democratic outcome had had led to, which was a very significant majority for them. Uh, and so, um, uh, I mean, constitutional assemblies, uh, I mean, the Chavista constitutional assembly is one example. You know, they, even though uh, I think that the 99 constitution was much more restrictive than anything that Chavez would, would want it afterwards, uh, you know, it was the result of a, of a you know, a massive, uh, it was like 95 to 5 percent participation, in, in, even though the Chavismo had only gotten 58 percent of the vote, it got 95 percent of the uh, the uh, assembleistas. So uh, I think that one is it's a it's a it's, it's a very difficult uh, type of, of transition. But of course, if the chavismo starts doing all these strategies that we mentioned about sidetracking the assembly, etc., I think this nuclear option will gain uh, some power. And I think if the government is weak enough, because I mean, remember that what we are going to see next year, the situation, the economic situation is not going to get any better unless there is a surprise. Uh, increasing the price of oil, right? That 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 gives some room to, uh, to, to for, for the government to 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 breathe. Otherwise, everything from I mean, next year will be worse than this year, not 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 better, right? And so and so uh, you will have you, the government will, will, might face and and this combined, you know, because people don't do not care about corruption and crime when things are good, you know. And this is, has been clearly seen in, you know, elsewhere in Latin America. But you start to mind that, that Celia's nephews or whatever uh, are doing uh, this kind of thing when you are feeling you know, uh, the, the pain uh, significantly. So, so this uh, combination you know, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, a major loss with, could, could lead to a like Montesinos kind of event, you know, when, like in Peru, in which the regime unraveled very quickly once they saw that they were, uh, 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 that, that they were going to lose power. A lot of people sort of started uh, playing a different game. So it's very hard uh, how to know. My sort of, my guess would be that a, a constitutional amendment negotiated with the moderate uh, Chavistas uh, would be the best way to transition. Uh, uh, but that, you know, that, that, that's a long story of how that could be in engineered. Well, um, listen, thank you all for being here. This was a Fascinating discussion. Thank you. I, I learned a lot. And and again, uh, uh, follow us uh, at the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center. All this video is going to be posted. And follow us on all the social media and all the activities that we are doing. Sally is the guru of all our outreach activities. Thank you, Sally, for helping us. Thanks to the College of, of, of Law for co-sponsoring the program. And most importantly, thank you all for being and joining us. This is great for us. Thank you. been a production of Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.